this in this setup. Um, my name is Brandon Ward. Uh, I'm originally from Houston. I actually went to St. Thomas High School. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, I went to Kansas State University, got my bachelor's degree in civil engineering uh, with a uh, focus on the structural engineering side. Um, but as you can see, this is not about structural engineering. A um, little background on me, I graduated from Kansas State and I went to go work for Halliburton as a field engineer specializing in hydraulic fracturing. And I've, uh, I've got a pretty good video that uh, should give you guys a good idea of kind of what what I did there um, and kind of how I evolved into into an operator position with, with Conoco Phillips. So right now I'm a completions engineer and I'll get into a little bit what, uh, what that is and and what I do for Conoco Phillips and how I collaborate uh, with with uh, various other engineering disciplines within the company. So, but my focus is on the exploration and production side, or what you know we consider the upstream division of the of the company. So, what happened? Or, or any of y'all familiar with you know exploration and production, or heard of upstream? Yes, no. So, what uh, typically what we do is we you know on the upstream side we. Uh, we find where the hydrocarbons are, where the oil and gas particles are. Um, we drill for it. We make a hole. Um, we we case it with steel tubing, and then I come in and complete the well. I establish communication between the well that we drilled and the reservoir. So, and then you know, once I'm done, we'll hand it off to to production. We'll start producing that oil and gas from the well, and uh, you know, we've got a team that'll that'll monitor. Uh, production and artificial lift, but I'll get into a little bit of that later. So, just want to give you a brief introduction, and uh, I'd like to keep this pretty informal. Uh, if you all have any questions, you know, feel free to in interrupt me. Um, I don't really care. Um, and the latter, the latter part of this presentation is, uh, you know, a lot for you guys in terms of, you know, what engineering attributes that, that a lot of these companies look for. Um, certain things that you guys can do to help become a better engineer and uh, you know network yourself so when it comes time to you know graduate college um, you've got a solid position lined up uh, with something that, that you're that you're interested in so anyway um, we'll go ahead and go ahead and get into it uh, this is just a random picture of a drilling rig I'm a visual guy so uh, you know what we have here is, is a drilling rig and typically um, Who's heard, who's heard of the Eagle Ford Shale in South Texas? Well, it, anyway, it's a, it's a pretty high-profile oil play right now. It's a, it's a big producer. Um, and we're drilling about two miles, over two miles deep into the earth, and then we'll, we'll drill horizontally, you know, about another mile. So, yeah. How do you drill horizontally? What we do on, the, on our BHA, on our bottom, bottom hole assembly, We've got a we've got a drill bit, um, and we've got certain tools down there that can that can actually that we can actually steer from surface. Um, so we'll have you know what's called the the directional drilling team. You know if y'all have heard of like the big service companies Halliburton or Schlumberger, they'll have these these tools on our bottom hole assembly that you know they'll be able to sit on surface and monitor 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 cuttings, and they'll be able to figure what type of rock we're drilling through in order to get to our target pay zone. So these guys will actually sit there and they'll actually steer, steer that uh, that drill bit to get to get where we need to. Wow. So yeah, it's uh, technology's come quite a long way, especially in the past five years in terms of, uh, especially horizontal drilling. Um, so good question though. Um, so anyway, that's that's your typical rig up. Um, there's I could go into so many details and be here for like ten hours, um, but uh, this this is what's called a derrick. And each each joint of drill pipe that we lower in the hole is about 30 feet. So this can we can fit about 90 feet uh, in this derrick at once that that will lower down in the hole. So just uh, it it enables us to, to drill faster. Um, and you know, like I said, we monitor cuttings. So we have what's what's called returns. So what's going to happen is um, as we drill in the well, we're actually pumping through that drill bit. So we're coming through the drill bit, and then that fluid and those cuttings are coming back up the hole, and they're going to end up somewhere, somewhere in this area. So what we do is we monitor those cuttings, like I said, and you know we'll be able to figure out where exactly we are, so those guys can steer uh, to make it to our, to our target zone. Um, so 
uh, kind of an outline. I'll go through some of the completions, engineering goals, uh, the types of reservoirs and hydrocarbons that, that we go after, you know, some types of completions. Um, hydraulic fracturing has been a pretty hot topic recently. I'm not sure if, if any of y'all have, have heard of that, um, but it's uh, extremely controversial. Uh, but I feel like a good person to ask. I design hydraulic fracturing jobs every day, so I know it from an engineering standpoint and an operational standpoint out in the field. So some of the safety factors uh, that you know, uh, some people may have questions with, I can help out with that. And I've got a good video that depicts uh, hydraulic fracturing. And then, like I said, you know, get into some of the engineering attributes that a lot of these companies work for and uh, you know, the uh, ample opportunity that you guys have set yourself up for, especially for you know, uh, emerging engineers. Um, so, exploration and production roles, we've got reservoir engineering. They, 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 they work with the geologists to help find and, and forecast what those reservoirs are going to produce. So if we find, if we find a reservoir um, and, and a reservoir comes back to us and says, you know, hey, this, this reservoir doesn't have enough hydrocarbons, they're going to make this, this field or a number of these wells economic, we'll actually move on to a different reservoir. So those guys, those guys in geology are, are the start of it all. Um, and drilling engineering, they, they're very much involved with, you know, kind of the picture I just showed you. Uh, they're, they're involved with designing a well plan in terms of how, how we build the well, how we drill, what types of drill bits to use, um, what types of uh, directional tools to use. They're involved in all that, all that collaboration. Um, so then I, I come in. Uh, completions, completions engineering, as I mentioned, I establish communication between the well bore and the rest bore, so we have the ability to maximize production of, of oil and natural gas. So, and lastly, production engineering. You know, once I once I hand this well over to production, they monitor how much production we're getting from these wells, if they're going to be, uh, you know, how long they're going to produce, um, and if, you know, and as we deplete these these reservoirs, you know, these like I said, these reservoirs are, you know two miles deep, right? And as we deplete oil and natural gas, you know, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to, we're going to be decreasing the pressure inside of that reservoir, you know, because you've got, you know, say 12,500 feet of, of earth sitting on top of the reservoir we're producing. So as we're extracting that, that oil and natural gas from the little, the little pore spaces um, in that reservoir, you know, that overburden stress is acting on, on that reservoir. So the pressure is going to deplete to a point where we're not going to be able to produce just by the reservoir pushing that fluid out of the well, right? So we've got to go in with what's called um, artificial lift systems, um, which is, you know, we'll, we'll install like a pump at the bottom of the well, and that pump will actually pump all the, all the hydrocarbons out of the well. Um, if I'm going too fast, uh, feel free to let me know. But anyway, uh, that's a general overview of the, the EMP engineering roles. Um, what I'm involved with. So, um, kind of a, I guess a, a day in the life. Um, you know, we're, we're involved in the life of the well, like I said, from finding the hydrocarbons to producing. And our job uh, in each role is to kind of generate cost estimates. Because, you know, each, each well in the Eagle Forge Jail costs about, I'm sure I tell you this, costs about $12 million. Um, per well, and this this year alone in 2012, we drilled 180 wells. So it's it's a lot of money that we have to keep track of, and it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of money that we have to forecast that we're spending because you know we're always trying to use different technologies to save money. So a lot a lot is on that. Um, you know, and the great thing about this job is you know, we're involved not only from an engineering and technical perspective, but from an operational perspective as well. You know, getting to work in teams with, with various disciplines to achieve the ultimate goal, and, uh, you know, working with those guys uh, to, to carry out, uh, to, to carry out those projects um, in the office and in the field. And it's good to go out to, to the field quite a bit. Um, you know, a lot of the supervisors on location say that engineers just sit in their ivory tower. Uh, I kind of laugh at them, but you know the field is a a great a great place to learn, and 
you know, it doesn't just apply to, to oil and gas. You know, getting getting out there and being hands on and being right where the action is can can help you exponentially in your careers. Um, so I definitely encourage you to uh, uh, you know take on take on those field roles uh, you know, if, when when possible. So, um, like I mentioned, interaction uh, in a professional office and field environment. Um, let's see, and you know, I kind of touched on some of the some of the utilized, utilization of, of new technologies to save money and maximize production of, of oil and gas. And um, I'll get into some of the new technology a little bit later. And I mentioned offset well experiments. So. Sometimes we'll have two wells, you know, maybe a thousand feet apart from each other, and you know, we want to be able to compare. You know, if we use a, te a certain technology on this well, you know, what can we use differently on this well, and and see what see what better production we can get from one or the other. So, you know, we do a lot of those experiments. You know, like I said, in order to, to maximize maximize production and uh, make money, right? So, you know, and it's it's our job to. You know, as engineers and project managers, to, to take ownership in, in what we do, and uh, you know, analyze the well operations, generate lessons learned, and share them to the rest of the exploration and production group, and, and move forward from there. Um, any questions? Yeah. No? Yeah. What's up? Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, you know, like I said, that, that overburden stress is going to be acting down as we're pushing, you know, but as, as that happens, we we decrease that, that pressure in the reservoir, and as we decrease the pressure in the reservoir, um, it's not going to last as long uh, in producing hydrocarbons on its own, so that's when we have to go in with the artificial lift methods. But, you know, and just to clarify something, you know, I'm not saying you guys, but I've I've gotten some some questions about, you know, is are there pools of oil, in in the reservoir, and, and there's there's not there's, you know, these oil and natural gas particles are in tiny tiny portables, and uh, extracting them is is a challenge. And I've got some pictures of different reservoirs, uh, to kind of give you guys a visual of what we're uh, what we're dealing with. But, um, you know, they're in, they're in tiny pores. There's 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 no pool. Um, so types of types of reservoirs and hydrocarbons. Uh, this doesn't happen anymore. This is what's called a gusher. Uh, there's probably one or two safety issues I can think of. And that. Um, it it does it does still happen on a I say a small scale, um, but it's you know we have uh, you know as as our safety culture has evolved quite a bit from. 1920s. So just FYI, this is not the recent photo. Um, so, but uh, but anyway, so so we deal with different types of rock, right? Uh, sand, some you know, rocks are more are more are more dense than others. Rocks are a little tighter than others. You know, uh, stiffer. So we kind of have to alter our design um, in terms of what our host reservoir properties are. So. Um, like I mentioned, sandstone, limestone, shale, and different hydrocarbons. You know, there's not just oil and natural gas. There, there's dry gas. There's condensate, which is wet gas. Um, volatile oil, which is referred to as a light crude. It's just, it all depends on, on the density, right? So, uh, light crude is obviously lighter than, you know, what I call a black, black oil or, or heavy crude. So, you can't, and you'll see the, the red red lines here, okay, those are, that's a well, right, so right here, uh, this this red to, to yellow to, to green, that's that's a target reservoir. So what happens is, you know, this is some of the modeling software that our, that our reservoir engineers get to, get to use. And so what you see is they'll, you know, we'll model where our wells are in terms of, um, you know, and we use this to, to place our wells in an effective manner in order to, to deplete that reservoir of, of all the hydrocarbons. So this is, uh, this, this one's pretty recent. This is, uh, you know, like I said, technology has come a long way in the, in the last five years. So, um, so different reservoirs.
So we've got we've got coal um, and, and shale, and shale is what uh, you know, you'll you'll hear unconventional reservoirs quite a bit, and a lot has to deal with with the shale. It's a, it's a real tight rock, so the ability of fluid to flow is is a lot lower. You know, it's it's tight rock, and it's really difficult to get all those all those hydrocarbons out. You know, and then these little pore throats is our you know our uh, our hydrocarbons. So um, you know, tight sand, sand, and, and then carbonate. Um, but uh, reservoir and geology deals deals with this quite a bit. Um, so uh, you know, in the past. We've optimized quite a bit, but you know, Barnett, the Barnett Shale was actually the first emerging unconventional shale play that we really found out how how to deal with with you know in combination with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. You know, so we found this to be extremely effective in, in producing hydrocarbons. So what you see here is a current map of all the unconventional shale plays that we now have the ability to, to produce our own. And a lot of this is, you know, really tight sand and, and, and shale. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity, especially for, for the United States, to build up uh, a huge supply of, of oil and natural gas. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that comes with a, with a big supply is, is uh, less money, right? Um, you know, natural gas right now is about, uh, Three dollars and forty-nine cents. Last time I checked, per uh, per standard cubic foot, where you know three years ago it was up at up at six fifty. Now, luckily, oil's been between you know eighty-five and hundred. So you know, like my my area down here in South Texas, is Eagle Ford Shale. Um, you know, there's a ton of activity because that's a huge liquid supply. So you know, a lot of guys are producing here in the Permian Basin. Um, I'm not sure if y'all have heard of that, uh, the Permian, but it's been producing since the 1920s. Um, and it's still, uh, still a bit of oil play. Um, in addition to, to the Bakken, the Bakken shale up in North Dakota, that's another 100% oil play that there's a ton of activity in. So yeah, I just want to show this map to let you know, you know in, in the future there's a lot of potential uh, and a lot of opportunities uh, to be able to travel to different areas of the of the United States and in, internationally, you know, for example, ConocoPhillips, we're a we're a global company, right? So uh, we have a recently found shell play in Poland. Uh, one of my coworkers I've been working with quite a bit since I, since I hired on actually just landed a job in Poland, and he and his, he and his wife are moving out there shortly. So it's kind of it's a lot of fun, you know. We get to we get to work in different plays around the U.S. and around the world, and get a lot of different experience and exposure um, to different engineering disciplines and different different areas. So there's a lot of a lot of opportunity. So, like I mentioned, um, you know, with horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracture, we've really been able to optimize uh, through unconventional reservoirs. Um, <coughs> So, like I mentioned, you know, here's kind of a cross-sectional view um, of what uh, what our target zone may look like uh, down in the earth, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll drill a well into, into here, whether it's vertical or, or, or horizontal. There are still a number of vertical wells um, out there, and uh, you know, we'll we'll be able to to tailor our design from an engineering and an operational standpoint, you know, to to be able to extract. Uh, you know, oil and gas, and 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 stay away from stay away from ex extracting water because when we produce water, we don't uh, we don't make any money. Um, honestly, well, we do use some some water for recycling for some various operations on the drilling and completion side. But um, if you guys have questions about that, I'd, I'd be happy to answer. Um, but like I said, I could be here for like six hours talking about all this stuff. Um, so. Uh, some of the different um, designs I get to deal with and, and choose. Uh, so we, when we get a well, when when the when the rig drills a well, and then the drilling rig moves off, it's just it's just the well with with casing. That's all it is. It's not open to the reservoir at all. 
So that's when that's when I come on board. What happens is we we go through certain stages. So we start with a well bore clean out. So what we do is we, we cement the well in place for structural stability and to isolate us from any groundwater aquifers that are you know anywhere from say 500 feet to 3,000 to a 3,000 foot depth. So what we'll do is you know, we'll case and cement multiple layers. It's not just one layer. Layer. So it, it, it gives us a lot of confidence that we're not um, going to be communicating with any of those groundwater aquifers. So what happens is I come in and I clean the well bore out of any particles or fines that are sitting in the lateral. So what's going to happen? You, know, I've got a, you know, say I've got a 6,500 foot lateral. You know, what do you think is going to happen when drilling is pumping their, their cement? Their cement down. You know, some of the, some of that cement is actually going to settle out in that lateral. Um, it's going to have enough room, and it's you know, it's not going to have a very high Reynolds number, right? Are you guys familiar with turbulent flow and all that all that good stuff? So, <clears throat> so with with turbulent flow, um, okay. So if you a good example would be so you've got you've got two screens. Right, so I'm holding two screens in my hand horizontally, right, and they're the same mesh screens, the same size holes. So I pour water in one of the, in one of the screens into a bucket. What do you think is going to happen? It's just going to fall right through. You know, there's not going to be a whole lot of resistance. So in the other screen, I'm going to pour, you know, gel, and that gel is going to take a lot longer to seep through those through those holes. So what happens is, you know, we want a a very turbulent fluid like like fresh water to be pumped down to help pick up all those particles instead of a gel that's kind of just going to sweep over that and not suspend it. So that's, that's kind of what I mean by, by turbulent flow, but I won't get into too many more details of, of the Reynolds number. Um, you guys, you'll, you're future engineers, um, I'll, I'll, I challenge you to go, go figure it out. <laughs> um, so I clean the well out of all the particles that the drilling rig you know, may, may have left in there. And then I move on to hydraulic fracturing. And I've got a good video um, you know, after this, but I just kind of want to touch on a few things. Um, I might as well just show it now. environmental impact. Take a look at the process today in underground shale formations. The initial well bore is drilled using a drill pipe and bit. Drilling mud is pumped down through the drill pipe to cool and lubricate the drill bit. Mud also helps stabilize the well bore and carry the rock fragment cuttings to the surface. The drilling continues well past the aquifer or groundwater level. Thousands of feet of rock separate shale reserves from the lowest groundwater reservoir. At this point, the drill pipe and bit are removed, and a steel tube called surface casing is set inside the well. The tube stabilizes the well sides. Now, just to pause real quick, everything you're seeing here is what uh, the drilling engineer is, is involved with, and, and when it gets to the completion side, I'll creating a protective barrier for both the well stream and any underground freshwater reservoirs. Cement is then pumped into the well through and out the casing, displacing any remaining drilling fluids and permanently securing the casing in place. By filling the gap between the casing and well bore, the cement creates a seal, protecting groundwater from contamination and keeping outside materials from entering the well flow. Once the first layer of casing is in place, it is pressure tested to ensure hydrocarbons and other fluids do not seep out into the formation as they are brought to the surface. The pipe and drill bit are lowered back into the well where the drilling continues. Another layer of casing and cementing is then constructed to create a second permanent protective barrier. 
multiple layers of casing and cementing are critical to safe well construction and drinking water protection. About 500 feet above the hydrocarbon bearing shale formation, a specific downhole drilling motor with sophisticated measuring instruments begins the angle drilling to create a horizontal path to penetrate the targeted layer of gas or oil bearing shale. Once the desired horizontal distance is reached, the casing and cementing process continues through the entire length of the well bore. A perforating tool is then inserted into the well. Okay, so like I mentioned before, um, you know, when, I, when the well is handed over to me, it's, it's just, uh, it's just you know, with, with the casing and, and nothing else. So here's, here's kind of when a completions engineer comes in. Creating holes in the shale layer, allowing hydrocarbons to enter the well stream. When the perforating tool is removed, fracturing fluid, made of mostly water and sand, is pumped into the well, opening tiny fractures deep into the shale. Water is removed, but the sand remains, holding the fractures open and allowing gas to travel from the shale out into the well. Bridge plugs are inserted and the fracturing process repeats across the entire length of the well. Once all the fractures are completed, the plugs are removed and gas flows to the surface. The entire drilling process takes about two to three months, but hydraulic fracturing takes only days and can allow for 20 to 40 years of energy production. Combining horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing reduces the footprint of drilling and makes it possible to produce oil and natural gas in places where previous technologies could not.
you know, a second well right next to that one. Um, and that, that causes issues, especially on, on the fracturing side, because, you know, fluid is going to follow the path of least resistance, right? So if you have, you know, an, a nine inch, a nine inch hole, you know, right next to, to the well that you're trying to fracture, you know, where do you think most of that fluid is going to go? So, um, on, an, on the negative side, it's, you know, you can have that as well, but, um, anyway, that's a good question. Any, did you already, you did already ask one, didn't you? Anything else? Um, yeah.
essentially mix, you know, it's, it's, it's a big tub, right? So it's, say it's a 20 barrel tub, you know, it's, it's large. So in that tub is where all of our propent and water is mixed and, and most of our chemicals. So from the blender, once everything is mixed and, uh, and agitated, you know, all that fluid goes through these high pressure pumps and into the well um, and down and down hole. Um, that's a pretty generic overview of, of that. Um, does anyone have uh, any, any questions regarding this process? Um, um, but uh, anyway, um, and we can actually stimulate two, you know, one well simultaneously, right? So, or two wells, two wells simultaneously. So, you know, I mentioned before we have offset well experiments. Well, two wells may be on the same, the same location, the same path. <coughs> So we could have a well, you know, 15 feet over from this one, and we can actually fracture both those wells at the same time. Um, so there's a number of different things that we can tailor operationally to uh, to get these wells completed. <coughs> fracture mechanics. Um, I don't want to get into too much too much detail on, on you know fracture mechanics and horizontal stresses and. All that, all that fun stuff. But there is, you know, it's not just you know we pump a bunch of fluid into a well and you know we assume it's going where we want to call it good. There's actually there's a lot of design from a, uh, there's a lot of design that goes into this. Um, you know, from the drilling side and, and placing our well in order to generate you know really long fractures because because the goal is here to get extremely long fractures out in, out into that reservoir. So the longer the longer the fractures, you know, the, the better the production in in some reservoirs. And another fun aspect I, I like to bring up, I keep mentioning, you know, different reservoirs. Um, you know, it's, it's not a cookie cutter design across the board. So it's all going to depend on your host reservoir. So you have the opportunity to work in different reservoirs in different areas and design for you know, you'll have something different to deal with. You know, a different project to deal with every day. So, you know, there's there's a lot of really exciting stuff out there, and fracture mechanics is, is one of them for me. But um, in a from a generic aspect, you know, we're we design our jobs to maximize our, our fracture width um, to to contact the as as much reservoir as possible. Um, and you saw a pretty good depiction in the video at the very end there, all those little fractures growing in different directions and building a complex fracture network and all that really exciting stuff. So, um, I guess from a Tonica Phillips standpoint, um, you know, I kind of wanted to add add a few things, you know, I keep talking about different areas. So, our mid content business unit, um, well, it's been in Midland. Mm, it's pretty rough, isn't it? Sorry if you have family there. Um, but anyway, so we our mid of business unit is, is based in Midland, Texas. I shouldn't I talk about my company like that, but whatever. So, but like I keep saying, the great part is you, know, you can work different areas. So, um, the Midcon it really focuses on the, the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. And what's what's really interesting, what what really bothers me is in Houston, we actually operate. The, the Permian Basin, which is right in the Midland Odessa area, um, which why and and it's not operated out of the Midland office, right? So um, anyway, when you guys grow up and become engineering managers, you can fix things like that. <coughs> so you know we're you know we have a number of assets, you know in the Permian and, and the Bakken, you know get to deal with shale gas development um, and horizontal laterals. Uh, you know, the horizontal laterals and fracturing stimulation piece are a huge part of what of what we do. So those just kind of show you where, you know, a graphical standpoint of, of where we uh, where we operate. Um, the Gulf Coast business unit is which uh, what I what I focus on, which is uh, which is here in Houston. Um, you know, like I said, Eagle Fort Shale, Lobo, which is which is you know south south of Texas, um, you know, right on Mexico. I wouldn't. You know, if you if you go to work down there, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't encourage you to, to cross the border. But anyway, uh, um, but Lobo has been a really good gas producer for quite some time.
time. Lobo actually, you know, gas prices were high. It used to be the Eagle Ford, so it was a it was a booming play for us. You know, there's there's a lot of people involved, a lot of money that we spent um, to, to help optimize that that reservoir. Um, you know, the offshore offshore is another another big issue. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities out there. Personally, I, I haven't been offshore yet. I, I'd love to go at some point. I, I hear it's I hear it's phenomenal. But you know, there's a lot of great experiences and learnings that you can get from from working um, you know in, in the deep water Gulf of Mexico. And an interesting point about about deep water is deep water accounts for almost almost 30 percent. Or 35 percent of the oil production in in Conoco Phillips, and it's it's that way for a lot of other companies. So, from one Eagle Ford well, we'll get you know say it varies on a couple of things. So, say 1,500 barrels of oil per day, which is which is quite a bit. And um, you know a Gulf of Mexico well could be you know 20,000 barrels of oil per day. So, um, you know another. You know, referring back to this gentleman's question about uh, you know wells from a from a single well bore, you know, I, I mentioned the pilot hole, and you know you'll have you know 40 wells drilled, you know from from this from this single rig, you know targeting targeting that same reservoir. So um, there's uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. So Alaska. Um, you know, Conoco Phillips has uh, a number of assets in Alaska, as does uh, Exxon Mobil, uh, which apparently used to be one of your sponsors uh, and my my competitor. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's a great company, I guess. But, um, so I'm not much of a cold weather person. Um, if if you know, but there's who's who's an outdoorsy person here. Okay, you guys, you guys would love Alaska. Um, there's a ton of hunting and, and fishing there. Um, you know, I, I, some of my coworkers had internships there, and they said it was absolutely gorgeous. You know, the, the terrain and everything, all the outdoors activity that you can that you can be involved with. Um, so Alaska would be, you know, especially, you know, not just going full time, but if you want to give it a shot, you know, intern. Intern in Alaska, see how you like it, feel it out. That's kind of what internships are, are built on, regardless. Is the you know, you've, you've got three months to you know figure out if if you truly enjoy you know the work that that you'll be doing, or you want, or if you want to work for a different company. But I'll I'll touch a little bit more on that later. Um, so you know, <clears throat> any any questions up to this point? Kind of going to start switching. Subjects a little bit, um, yeah. Well, I'll kind of I'll talk about this, but if, if you guys want to refer back to questions on the exploration and production side, I'd be happy to, to refer back to that. Um, so, career building. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the engineering candidates um, that that uh, that do well for themselves, you know, they. They're self, they're self starters, you know, and I think you guys are, are there regardless because to be an engineer, you've got to have that uh, that mindset, that that innovative mindset, and uh, um, the ability to to want to to better to better things uh, for the future, whether it's whether it's oil and gas, whether it's structural engineering, whether it's environmental engineering, whatever it is, um, you know, you've got to have the ability to really look at a look at a problem and say. You know, and be able to solve it. And you know, a lot of people. You know, some people say, you know, you're good at math and science. You should be an engineer. I mean, there is a lot of math and science involved, but it's it's the problem solving, it's the ability to communicate effectively in a team environment to reach to be able to solve that problem and reach the ultimate goal. And that's what makes you know a good a good engineer. Um, so you know, I mentioned uh, communicate effectively. You know, we. We have uh, this this stereotype is like engineers. Yeah, engineers don't have any personality as well. I, mean, I beg to differ. I don't. I guess I don't really have much one, but I, I don't know. I, I hold myself above that, that stereotype. But anyway, that's just uh, something I, I like to laugh at. But the 
you've got to be able to you know communicate effect effectively. Um, you know, like I keep saying, working in team environments um, to achieve a goal, and you know, you guys, you know, are obviously doing doing very well with that. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I talked to I talked to Alan a little bit before this, and I guess uh, you know some of the guys really haven't touched on internships, and I think it's a huge part of, of career building. Um, are y'all familiar with with internships or co-ops or anything like that? So. Um, you know, when you guys go to college, um, how many are seniors in here? Okay, very nice. Well, congratulations. Um, good luck. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the one of the biggest parts when you when you get to school, especially as like a freshman or sophomore, you know, I was a little bit a little bit timid um, to to get involved and get you know really acclimated with you know going to some of these career presentations and so forth because in the back of my mind I'm like, you know, these companies they're not they're not they're not gonna want some freshman or sophomore who doesn't have any any experience, you know. <clears throat> but I started to think and you know the, the sooner that you get your name out there and start you know and it's you don't even have to interview, you know, for a job. You you practice interview. And a lot of these guys going up to the career fairs, they know that and they, they relish you know the fact that that you that you have the mindset and the and the confidence um, uh, to to do that. So my advice would be to get started extremely early. Um, you know, get involved with uh, you know companies and career fairs and, and go to those uh, career presentations. And you know, I encourage you to ask ask a lot of questions because you know it's you know college is. Uh, is, is that time where you, you really grow into into an adult and then you then you get into the working world. Um, you, know, you graduate in May of 2010, the end of summer comes along and it's like, why am I not going back to school? You know, so you're you're in it for the for the long haul, which is which is great. Um, you know, or some of you guys per, pursue masters or you know become PhDs, you know, the opportunities are endless, especially with engineering degrees. Um, and another thing I applaud you on is is going for a competitive degree because that is looked extremely highly upon in the in the working world in, in from every single company. Um, you know, it's it's unfortunate, but there are a number of 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 kids and college students that that don't want to put in the work now and just kind of live live in the present. But you know, you don't get me wrong, you can still have plenty plenty of fun, but you know, it's 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 the guys um, and the girls that uh, that do well. You know, when they actually persevere through an engineering curriculum, and you know they they work hard. And you know, I've I, I've been very fortunate to land with with a company like Conoco Phillips. You know, but I graduated college with like a 2.9 GPA. I mean, you know, and and some of these companies really limit. Uh, you know, some of the GPAs are like three five or three seven five, and trust me, they're the vast majority out there. They will not care what your GPA is. Now, y'all probably do much better than I did, but you know, there are a lot of companies that really don't care about a GPA. You know, a GPA is just used to to get to get your foot in the door, and in a year, like that that won't matter at all. So. Um, the real factors that come into play, like I said, communication skills, ability to work in a team environment, and going back to internships, getting that experiment or getting that experience early on, before before you guys go out into the working world, and not only builds your resume, but it gets you acclimated with with different companies, different positions, different people. There's a lot you can learn from from internships and going out there and applying yourself uh, in. In front of a lot of these guys, and it uh, it's 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 noticed by by quite a few. You know, I was you know I've I was lucky enough to land three three summer internships, and by the summer after my sophomore year, I was like you know I'd, <clears throat> yeah I wanted to just enjoy the summer. It's been a rough year of college, um, but you know I was extremely glad that you know I stuck with it and and got the experience and. You know, apply some of the lessons learned that, that I got from from my perspective to in order to uh, you know, graduate and land land a solid position. 
uh, before I graduated college. Um, excuse me. So, so yeah, uh, research companies research their mission. You know, what are what are they about? What are their long term goals? Uh, what do they plan investing in in the future? And you can kind of tailor that to what you you know what you'd like to do. So, for example. You know, from an oil and gas standpoint, when I was researching ConocoPhillips, I was like, okay, so how much money you know, are these guys going to invest in this type of you know, shale play or this type of technology where I can, where I can make myself stand out? And you know, chances are you're not going to find your first job isn't going to be something that you absolutely love. But what you do is you, you put yourself in a position to be successful, right? So whether you're... You know, I, I did a lot of research on, on clean water, on, on water management. Did I enjoy that? Not really. But you know, I, I worked hard at it, and you know, there are certain things that, that make you stand out in front of in front of your peers um, that these companies really look for, and and ask questions, ask ask a lot of questions. Um, so. Uh, lastly, oil and gas industry as a whole, there are a ton of opportunities um, on the upstream and the downstream side. And downstream is more pipelines and, and refineries. Um, I'm not as well versed in, in that, but just oil and gas industry as a whole. And the average age of you know employees is about 42 to 45 years old. So recent college graduates have huge opportunities in front of them to be able to learn from these guys that have been in the industry for 20 and 30 years um, and take that knowledge to, to, in order to better their career um, long term. So, you know, I'd say time to bridge the gap, you know, at, at, when I was at Halpern, you know, they, this, this was one of their slogans. And, um, but like I said, there's, there's a ton of opportunity. Um, and I, as I mentioned before, you know, ability to work in you know, very challenging environments. Uh, you know, Australia, Poland, Alaska. I know uh, we're we're exploring the Arctic, uh, deep water Arctic, a little bit. Um, and it's it's very rewarding. Um, and I'm not just I'm not talking about money. You know, I'm talking like you know, like I said, we drilled 180 wells, and you know, I I complete you know quite a few of those, and it's it's very self rewarding to be able to complete a well successfully uh, in a team environment and be able to utilize a design that you have implemented um, on on certain projects and you know this being said it doesn't just apply to the oil and gas industry you, know, you guys clearly have already been been applying yourselves um, and there's there's a lot of opportunity for that so um, it's kind of a short Presentation actually it was not um, at all. So uh, you know, I'd like to open it up for, for any questions or comments, whether it's college, internships, interviewing, working world, um, whatever you guys have in the back of your minds, please uh, feel free to ask. Yeah. Um, what did you do with the internships? So what I did, for example, I had a, a structural engineering internship with a company here in Houston, and I was challenged to, uh, you know, help help design help design a bridge, right? So what um, what was given to me was, you know, I was involved with the design software, I was involved in the the planning and engineering process. I would, you know, a lot of these designs, those design types are based on code books, right? So we we have to account for certain certain loads um, so so the bridge will actually stand up, you know, for a long period of time. So I was involved from a design perspective, um, team management uh, and survey perspective, right? So I'd I get the opportunity to, to go out to the field, you know, or Houston. I just I use the field very loosely. So you know go out to go out to Houston and actually work work in the field and get a better visual of, of, what, of what was going on. And, you know, I'd work with, with engineers, I'd work with, you know, principal engineers, um, and then I would be able to, I'd come up with a formal design uh, for, for those guys. And it's actually pretty neat because they're, they're in the middle of, of building it right now. So even though I'm doing absolutely nothing related to structural engineering, uh, that, was, that was a really good experience. So it's a lot of collaboration. Uh, between people, um, 
You know, and the great part is, and I was concerned about this because I've always been hard on myself. Um, you know, you go into these internships as as a college student. They do not expect you to know everything. They are there to be your mentor to kind of help help guide you. So, you know, don't don't be afraid to, like I said, ask questions, or you know, don't don't expect that that you know the guy who hired you or the the president of the company expects you to you know design a bridge on your on your own. Um, you know, there's you know, like I said, it's a time to to learn, develop your career, ask questions. And develop your engineering uh, uh, sense sense of design uh, to be able, you know, for the for the betterment of yourself and, and the company. So. Kyla Swirl, please report to the guidance office. Kyla Swirl. Did someone else have a name raised? Did you? Uh, what do you do like on a day to day basis? So a day to day basis, I wake up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm kidding. It's actually it's actually four thirty. <laughs> Um, now this isn't every engineer, so I'll, I'll walk you, I'll walk you a, a day in the life of, of Brandon Moore. So wake up at 4:30, um, get to the office at about 5:15, and what I'll do is, you know, I have like right now I have 15 welds that I'm in the middle of completing. So what I'll do is I'll go in, and we've got seven o'clock morning meetings every single morning. Um, so I'll go in, I will, I'll look at uh, all the operations that went on. I'll double check my well costs because, you know, like I said, we use different technologies to, you know, keep that, uh, keep the cost as low as possible. So, I'll, I'll check costs and well operations. And, you know, I, I mentioned uh, supervisors on location earlier. We have a number of supervisors that work 24/7 that are kind of our eyes and ears out there in the field when, when we can't be out in, in the field. So. I'll give them a call, make sure everything's going well, um, and if not, you know, we'll troubleshoot on the fly. So, you know, we'll have our seven o'clock morning meeting. We'll discuss any special projects or you know special operations that are going on on certain wells and uh, opportunities to to improve them. So, after that, um, you know, we've we have a lot of a lot of service companies that bring breakfast. So I'll go get breakfast. Um, and some coffee. I'll go back to my office, and what I'll do is I've I've got some special projects that I'm working on right now. So I'll spend I'll spend a lot of time doing project management. So I'll make sure to you know call a service company to make sure that they have everything lined up for my project. I'll schedule meetings with ConocoPhillips employees to to let them know what's going on, what we expect, and actually write. Uh, procedure, you know, in uh, in either Word or Excel, um, and let them know kind of step by step what we plan to do and any contingency designs that we may have to utilize, and you know, uh, if something goes wrong, because you know, like I said, these wells are like 18,000 feet. I mean, we can do all the speculation and modeling that we want, but who knows what is going on that deep inside the Earth, which is, you know, one of the great things about this about this industry. Um, so I'll spend a lot of time from a project management standpoint, <clears throat> and any well, any well operations that I have upcoming, like a hydraulic fracture stimulation, I'll actually design, you know, the the water volume and, and how we actually pump the job um, in order to you know effectively you know stimulate this reservoir and uh, and maximize production. So you know I'll probably spend some more time on the project management side. Um, you know, there are a lot of meetings. There are a lot of meetings on new technologies, on after-action reviews. Um, you know, we have a lot of in-house service companies. Um, so if we have a question about a certain tool or technology, we can go to them easily, schedule a meeting. Um, so it's, you know, like I said, it's a lot of project management, a lot of engineering design, uh, team building, collaboration. A lot, you know, all that stuff uh, comes comes into play. Um, and let's see. I will end the day um, by you know catching up on emails since I've been in, in meetings for most of the afternoon. Um, you know, and once again, probably you know make sure everything in the field is, is going the way the way it should be. Um, and it's <clears throat> each well is different, right? So you have the opportunity to be doing something different, working on a different project. You know, every day. So it's. 
it's it's very exciting. It's it's fast paced. It's it's rewarding, um, and it's it's a great career building opportunity. So that's that's kind of a, a day in the life. And you know, I'll get the opportunity to kind of talk to my boss, you know, a little bit, um, uh, you know, talk with you know people in various levels of the company, you know, network. You know, that's that's one of the other things that, that I keep I keep mentioning is, is networking within within the company and, and outside the company because it's as global of an industry as this is it's a very small world so you you never know who you'll run into in the future um, like so I, I I'm an Eagle Scout right so my my MC at my Eagle Scout Court of Honor um, Mr you know Mike Brownlee he's actually a reservoir engineer for ConocoPhillips, and we work on the same floor. And my first day there, I wanted to get some coffee, and he's there, and I'm like, Mr. Brownlee? He's like, Brandon? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a very small world, so um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So, God, that was a weird term. <laughs> weird, I did not expect that. Um, but yeah, he is real close to retirement. So he's pretty checked out. But anyway, um, yeah, it's, that's a really good question. So every day is different. And what's, what's really nice is, you know, like, like you mentioned, rewarding. Um, you know, there there's certain uh, you know benefits that go on to how how well of a, a job you do, and in terms from an economic standpoint and an engineering standpoint, to kind of make yourself stand out. So it's all up to you. Uh, you've got a lot of responsibility. Um, it's maybe that's a sign. But anyway, good question. They've a lot, and I'll say that because you know they've done they've done so much for us in in the past five years. So you know I, I keep mentioning different tools that we're using. And um, so do you remember in the in the video you saw just you know these fractured you know we we perforate you know we we run shape charges down the hole we perforate they're 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 guns essentially. So one of the technologies that's that's really revolutionized the, the hydraulic fracturing aspect is using a tool, a sleeve that actually slides open instead of you know, having to run in with, with these perforating guns. You know, we can actually run those tools as, as a part of our casing string. So that saves us a lot of, a lot of time and money. You know, we, we cut our fracturing time in half. Um, and we actually, we, we've seen a lot of increased production. Uh, with, use, with using tools like that. And another big thing I'd like to mention is from an environmental standpoint. Um, so science has really gone into uh, a lot of research and optimization uh, for, for water recycling, for reusage, for drilling and fracturing operations. So we have less, less of a footprint, we use less water, um, and we still, we still have the same outcome in, in all of our wells. So, um, Science and from an environmental standpoint, and uh, downhole tools, and we actually we're looking at a fraction company. You know, these fraction companies right now they're using diesel as fuel. So right now, a company is actually looking into looking into using steam. Um, so there's science, research, and development is a huge, huge part of this industry. And from my standpoint, you know, I I'm not an R&D guy. I let those guys you know do it do what they're best at, and then I start researching those technologies and how that can help me out. And, you know, like I mentioned, you know, this is a day-by-day -day basis looking into new technologies. So R&D and science has had and will have uh, a huge effect on this industry and, and how, we, how we do our business from an environmental standpoint and from a